Hello, this is Adam Paulson welcoming you to this course webinar which is brought to you by the Bite Size Bioscience Writer Academy. The Bite Size Bioscience Writer Academy is the place to come if you're interested in launching a career in science writing. With our writer onboarding courses, we'll provide you with all the tools you need to perfect your science prose. We'll walk you through getting started in science writing, writing for the web, creative writing techniques for scientists and much more. Why not visit us at sciencewriteracademy.bitesizebio.com where you'll find more information about some of our upcoming courses and how Bite Size Bio can help kickstart your science writing career. Today's presentation is titled Grammar 101 and is being presented by Dr. Jennifer Swift, Managing Editor at Bite Size Bio. Jennifer has worked as an editor for almost a decade and leads the Science Writer Academy initiative at Bite Size Bio. She has worked across STEM and arts publishing as a copy editor, proofreader and project manager and has a wealth of experience in academic and trade publishing, having worked on journals, books and databases over the course of her career. Jennifer received her PhD at the University of St Andrews. As always, we'll have a question and answer session after the presentation, so please type any questions that you have into the questions box which appears on the bottom panel of your screen, and I'll put them to Jennifer at the end of the presentation. A link to view a recording of this presentation will be sent to you in due course. So now over to you, Jennifer, for the presentation. Thanks very much, Adam, and hello, everyone. Welcome to the first of our Bite Size Bio Science Writer Academy workshops. It's great to have so many of you here with us today. Um, our series of workshops is intended to help you launch or develop a career in science writing. So we're really excited to be bringing these to you. And we've decided to kick off today with Grammar 101 for Scientists. And lots of you have expressed an interest in science writing as a career or a sideline um, on a sideline to your academic work, and the cornerstone of good writing is a decent grasp of grammar. Now, grammar is just a system of constraints on a language that informs how sentences are constructed. Um, English, like other languages, is obviously a living, fluid language, and it's changing all the time. New words are coming in, and that's great, and there are so many interesting things about how language changes over time. But at the same time, it's really important that some kind of structural constraints are followed, because that's how meaning is conveyed and if we don't have clear meaning we're left with ambiguity and that is in no one's interest either you or the writer or the people who are reading your writing and we're increasingly living our lives online and um, especially at the moment and writing emails texts blogs is much more um common than communicating in person at the moment and the fact of the matter is that people judge people will judge our writing so your grammar and your spelling for example kind of create the first impression for your reader and the better your grammar the better that first impression so if you're looking to set yourself up as a science writer good grammar will make your writing easy to understand it will make your message easy to follow and also it will please your editors which is always a good thing um, it'll also be much nicer for you if you're getting less feedback on a piece of writing and breaking grammar rules because it's a conscious choice is much better than breaking them because you don't know any better. Um, so today we're just going to look at some of the common grammar pitfalls that we as editors see time and time again and we hope that you'll all leave here with some pointers on how to polish your own science writing. So the objectives for today's workshop, we're going to look at some common grammar pitfalls, we're going to suggest ways to fix these and we're going to provide some examples and I should say at this stage we're not going to cover everything, you know, there are so many different things we could cover today. So this is going to kind of be a sort of whistle stop tour of grammar and usage as well, really. And we'll be kind of flitting between topics um, because we only have an hour and I'm aware that you're all busy people with other things to do. Um, so like I say, we're going to be um, chopping and changing between topics, but these are the things that hopefully are going to help you improve your own writing. Now, before we get stuck in, just a couple of um, housekeeping points. Um, we're going to have the main presentation, and then at the end, we're going to have time for a question and answer a question and answer session. You might have questions during the presentation and that's absolutely fine. You can pop them in the Q&A box which you access at the bottom of your screens um, or you can wait until the end and ask questions. All questions will 
be answered at the end, however. And this is just to kind of maintain the flow of the presentation and to keep us to time. Like I say, we've all got other things to be doing after this. Um, there will also be a recording available for a limited time afterwards to watch after the event so you can go back and look over any of the points that are raised. Now, why should you listen to us um, in the Bite Size Bio editorial team? Well, we've all been editors in some form or another um, for a long time. We've worked as editors, proofreaders, editorial managers. We've done journal management. We've worked across STEM and arts and humanities publishing. So we've got quite a wide range of experience. You know, we've worked for high impact academic journals. We've worked for universities. We've worked for trade publishers. And we've worked across the likes of journals, books, and databases. But we also, all of us in the editorial team here have PhDs. So we've been where you are. We know what it's like to be in academia, but we also know what it's like to move into a different career. So let's kick off then. So the things we're going to cover today, like I said, are some of the things that crop up a lot when we've been editing science writing. So it's kind of like a top 10 of grammar pitfalls, if you like. And these are things that can trip up everyone. So we're gonna look at things like when to use me and I, we're going to look at parallel sentence construction, sentence length and what makes for good sentence length. We are going to cover, cover active and passive voice and when to use each one. Consistency, which is a biggie in science writing or any kind of writing really. We're going to look at confusables. We're going to look at agreement, a little bit about punctuation, something on run on sentences and then finally restrictive and non-restrictive clauses and if any of this terminology makes you feel like this little guy in the picture please don't worry we're going to explain everything as we go along and hopefully everything will become clear and what I would say is because we can't cover everything in today's workshop and um, get hold of a grammar reference book you know it doesn't have to be something totally hardcore you don't need to be memorizing the Chicago manual of style and um, you know there are tons of really accessible short funny dare I say books on grammar out there and um, you know just do a quick google find something that suits you and just have that as a reference guide while you're writing because it really will improve your writing and um, if you prefer listening to podcasts again there are tons of grammar podcasts out there now and um, so if you prefer taking in taking in information that way subscribe to something like grammar girl or plain english or away with words um, and again that will really help and the more you read or listen and um, the more automatic this stuff will become and you'll kind of start to get a sense of what makes for good writing and what makes for good grammar um, and you'll find that over time you'll have to be checking this stuff less and less and less because like I say it will just become second nature so before we get stuck in I'm just going to say a tiny little bit about the terminology that's going to crop, crop up quite a lot today so if we look at a simple English sentence, so something like the cat sat on the mat, and I'm really sorry, you're going to have to put up with lots of my terribly contrived examples throughout the workshop today, um, but bear with me. So if we have a simple English sentence, it's made up of a subject, the cat, so the personal thing doing the action, it's made up of a verb, which is the action, so sit, sat in this case, and it's made up of an object, so a personal thing on the receiving end of the action, so in this case the mat. Now, in a simple English sentence, subject, verb, object is the word order followed because English is what's known as is what's known as an analytic language. Um, <clears throat> word order is what determines meaning. You know, in something different like a synthetic language, something like Latin, for example, um, you have inflections which are basically different endings on words, and it's those inflectional endings that convey meaning. English doesn't have that, so it's the word order that we rely on. So the words are the same, regardless of whether they're the subject of the sentence or the object. That's for the most part. However, pronouns are slightly different and don't follow this no change rule. And basically, a pronoun is just something that saves you having to repeat a noun. It stands in for a noun. So in a sentence, you don't have to keep repeating that noun over and over again. And pronouns, apart from you, because there's always an exception, change depending on whether they're the subject or the object of a sentence. And this can sometimes seem to trip people up. So let's have a wee look at some examples. So I went to the park, John visited me. Two simple sentences. It's pretty obvious who the subject is in each. So in the first sentence, I, I am doing the going, um, 
I is the subject. In the second sentence, John is doing the visiting. John is the subject. The object is me because I am the one being visited. I'm, I'm on the receiving end of the action, as it were. So me is the object. So far, so good. Now, problems <clears throat> tend to creep in when you have subjects or objects of more than one person and people try to hyper correct whether they think that's because of politeness or for some other reason so you often get sentences that say things like John visited Bob and I or nobody was in the lab but John and I um, and you can see that what we've got here is the subject pronoun I being used in the object position because Bob and I and John and I are on the receiving ends of the actions in those examples we need me so you need John visited Bob and me and nobody was in the lab but John and me. And if you're confused about whether you need to use I or me with multiple actors, a really easy tip to work out what to do is to take out those other actors. So if you take out Bob and you take out John in those last two sentences, you'd be left with John visited I or nobody was in the lab but I. And you can that you know that you can tell that that doesn't sound right. That isn't what you would say if you just had a single actor. So take out those other actors and that's a really easy way to work out whether you need to use I or me. Again, making sure you're using the right pronouns in the right context um, is a really quick way to polish up your writing. Moving on, we're going to look at parallel sentences and this is something we come up quite a lot in, um, come up against quite a lot in science writing, you have sentences that are unbalanced or non-parallel. Basically, a parallel sentence is when the components of that sentence, so words, phrases, or clauses, have the same grammatical structure. And this, having sentences that are balanced lends, it makes your writing more polished and seems more professional. So as far as possible, we want to try and make our sentences balanced. Now, a parallel sentence, like I've said, is one that is structured when each part is structured in the same way. So if you're writing a sentence and you've got particular forms of a verb for a series of examples, for instance, so in this first example, we've got if you like running, skiing and to ride a bicycle, you'll love this. You can see that we've got running and skiing, but then all of a sudden we, we switch to an infinitive to ride. And that means the sentence isn't balanced. It's no longer parallel. So pick a particular verb form and stick with it. So in this instance, you'd want to change it to something like, if you like running, skiing and riding a bicycle, you'll love this. You can see the construction in each of those examples is the same. In the second example, what we've got is a series of um, examples about something that you're going to learn in a conference talk. And we can see that two of these um, clauses contain verbs. So you'll learn about the benefits of this technology, more about the optimization of antibodies for design successful experiments, and hear insights from several case studies. But you can see this middle um, example doesn't have a verb, and that means that the sentence isn't balanced. So the easiest way to fix this is to pop a verb in for that middle example, and then you've made your sentence parallel. Um, if it helps, a good tip for checking balance in your sentences is to split them into a list. So if you kind of divide all those examples up, it would be much easier to see that each one needs a verb at the beginning to make the sentence structure balanced. Now, speaking of lists, non-parallel constructions come up here quite commonly as well. And it's normally just a difference between um, having some of the text in the introductory clause for the list and then some of the parts of the text in the bullet points themselves. So you can see in this first example, in this workshop, you'll learn more about grammar, discover some top grammar tips, leave feeling enthused about grammar, we hope, and do some great writing. And you can see that the bottom three bullet points in this example all begin with verbs. But that first example, the verb has been left in the introductory text. So it's a really quick fix. You just need to move that verb down, put it at the beginning of the first bullet point, and immediately you've balanced your sentence. Um, so again, just, just something to look out for. It will make your writing <clears throat> look much more polished and much more professional. 
sentence length. Sentence length is a biggie and you will read lots about this in um, style guides, writing guides, things like that. Um, the longer a sentence, essentially the more difficult it is to understand. But in academic writing, which lots of us are really used to, long sentences are pretty common. You know, you're expressing complex ideas, um, lots of information to get across. But sometimes if you let too many, sen too many long sentences um, fill your writing, it can be really difficult to follow. And it can be hard for the reader to work out, you know, what the main noun is, for example. And that means your message can get lost. That being said, you need you need to tailor your sentences to your audience. I mean, obviously, if you're presenting, a, if your piece of writing is intended for an academic audience, you're probably going to be able to have slightly longer sentences than if you were trying to explain your research to 10 year olds or something, for example. But essentially, um, shorter sentences, as far as you can make that happen, are better. Um, having said that, variety is probably the most important thing. If you had all of your sentences the exact same length, your writing would become really dull, frankly. Um, so you don't want paragraphs composed entirely of long sentences, and you don't want them composed entirely of really short ones either. You know, you can mix up your sentence length, and if you think an audience is ready for it, you can put in a slightly longer sentence. Um, but that variety is really important to keep your writing vibrant. Um, you'll read lots of kind of um, rules of thumb about the average um, word length of sentences. And most kind of style guides will say something around 20 being a maximum. Um, but again, knowing your audience is really important and that will kind of determine, um, determine the kind of average sentence length that you're using in your writing. But even if you do have a long sentence, um, make sure it's as simple as possible and as concise as possible. Uh, concise as po possible. Um, take out all the clutter that your sentence doesn't need because your readers will thank you for it because your message will be clearer. And that's basically what we're trying to do is get our message across to our readers. So if we look at a couple of examples, this is a marketing piece from Innocent Drinks. And for those of you who aren't in the UK, um, Innocent are a smoothie company, so a drinks, com a drinks company. Um, and this is just a bit about their um, company background. And you can see that because this is a marketing piece, they're trying to get something, essentially trying to get someone to buy something. All of their sentences are short and on message, you know, and each one keeps the message. None of the sentences is difficult to read. And then, you know, the business needs a name. It takes nine months to think of one. For a while, the brand is known as Fast Tractor then hungry aphid, then nude, then naked, then innocent. And those really short sentences, those two word sentences at the end, with the, the then kind of almost reflects the idea of discarding each of those suggestions until they strike on innocent, which then becomes the company name. So you can see short sentences in this case are really, really effective. Now in this second example, this is from a book um, and it's, a, it's actually a grammar book, it's about punctuation. Um, so if any of you um, don't already have this in your library, I would um, strongly suggest you go out and buy it. It's great, it's really accessible. Um, you know, tons of really, really useful information in there. Um, and although this is a reference book, it's still a piece of creative writing. And you can see that there's much more variety in sentence length. And I think this is like a really good example to show you how using different sentence length can kind of reflect the message of your piece of writing. So I'm just going to read it out just so you can kind of get a sense of the rhythm. So for any true stickler, you see, the sight of the plural word plural word books with an apostrophe in it will trigger a ghastly private emotional process similar to the stages of bereavement, though greatly accelerated. First, there is shock. Within seconds, shock gives way to disbelief, disbelief to pain and pain to anger. Finally, and this is where the analogy breaks down, anger gives way to a righteous urge to perpetuate an act of criminal damage with the aid of a permanent marker. So you can see we've got quite a long sentence at the beginning, but that sentence is setting the scene. It's drawing the reader in and it's letting them know what's coming next. Now that second sentence first there is shock it's a really really short sentence especially after coming that coming after that first long one um and it also kind of reflects the emotion of shock it's short and it's sharp and it's abrupt but then again we've got a slightly longer sentence so that is 
again, starting to starting to build the momentum back up and it's representing the move through those different emotional stages, disbelief, pain, anger. And then again, we've got a long sentence at the end and that final long sentence almost kind of becomes a reflection of the author's anger and you find yourself speeding up as you're reading it so you can feel what the author was feeling um, when she looks at misplaced, misplaced apostrophes. So it's a really, really effective piece of writing. And I hope it kind of shows you um, how sentence length can work really, really well. Um, and I would say that a lot of what determines good sentence length in your writing is rhythm. So I'd really encourage you to read your writing out loud, whether that's an academic paper. I mean, you probably do that already when you're preparing for conference talks. But even if you're writing a blog post, for example, read it out loud because lots of like what makes good rhythm is instinctive. You know, the more you kind of hear, the more you get a sense for what makes good writing um, so you can just do it in the mirror to yourself if you don't feel comfortable doing it in front of other people but reading it out loud um, will really really help you work out the right kind of sentence length for your, for your piece of writing okay moving on we're going to look at active and passive voice and again in style guides and writing guides you'll see that this is something that comes up um, quite a lot there are two ways to render sentences in English. You can use the active voice or you can use the passive voice. And basically, if you're using the active voice, the subject is doing the action. Whereas in the passive voice, the target of the action, so the object, is moved to the subject position. So it kind of subordinates the subject. Um, the active voice is a lot more immediate because you have that subject doing the action. Whereas the passive voice, you know, um, it can seem distant or vague or unnecessarily wordy because you require more words to construct the passive voice. And often, if you're used to academic writing, the passive voice is what we use because, you know, it kind of affords a degree of dispassion. You can kind of maintain a sort of sense of objective distance. And oftentimes, it doesn't matter so much who is doing a particular action. Uh, having said that, you need to think really carefully about when you employ the passive voice. And if you're writing something like a blog post, for example, or a marketing piece, the active voice is preferable um, because it makes your writing seem much more immediate, more direct, and that creates a better link with your audience, which will make it easier um, for you to get your message across. So if we look at a couple of examples, Bob did the experiment. The active voice, we've got Bob, the subject, he's carrying out the act, he's carrying out the action. Um, if we were to render that in the passive, we'd have something like the experiment was done by Bob. Again, you see, it doesn't, Bob becomes kind of subordinated. He, he isn't as important in that sentence. Um, but again, that kind of makes it seem more distant. So if you're trying to engage with your audience and your reader, the active voice is really going to be the one you want to try and use as much as possible. And the passive voice can also kind of be an obscuring or an, avo an avoidance tactic. So it's like saying, rather than saying something like, Bob stole the pipettes, which would be active, it would be saying something like, pipettes were stolen, or something like, mistakes were made, if someone doesn't want to admit who made a mistake. You know, it kind of, it makes that, it makes the subject vague you don't know who you don't necessarily know who did an action um but that creates distance between you and your reader so as far as possible try and use the active voice when you can and again that's a really really easy way to sharpen up your writing tighten up your writing consistency this is a huge thing in writing, any kind of writing. And it's probably one of the things that editors um, spend most of their time working on on a piece of writing is making it consistent. And consistency is essentially just using the same conventions throughout a piece of writing. And the conventions that you use will depend on um, who it is you're writing for. So if you're writing for a particular client or a particular journal, for example, you'll normally be given a style guide. And this style guide will kind of outline things like 
how you set out numbers. So do you use digits or numbers written out? Um, what do you do for spelling? Do you use British um, English or do you use American English? Here at Bite Size Bio, for example, we use um, American spelling. Dates, how do you format dates? Do you use ordinals? What comes first, the day or the month? These kinds of things. What kind of words are capitalized? Are headings capitalized? Are they not? Do you capitalize words after a colon? You know, all these kinds of things which should be laid out in a style guide. Hyphenation, again, is another really big one. What kind of, what kind of words are hyphenated? Because um, consistency is probably the biggest thing that you can employ to make your writing look professional. Um, and lots of the things that kind of come up here, so these things that I've just mentioned, so numbers, spelling dates, they're not wrong. Um, it's, you know, it's just, it's a usage thing. Um, but like I say, the more consistent you are, the more professional your writing is going to look. So again, if we look at some of my terribly contrived examples, um, these are the kinds of things that are gonna make your writing look sloppy. So you can see in this example here, the lab meeting is at 9 a.m. on November the 26th. Please confirm attendance by, by 5 p.m. on the 25th of November. You can see, for example, we've got time rendered in two different ways. So we've got 9 a.m. with 9 and a.m. closed up, uppercase letters, no full points. Whereas for the 5 p.m., we've got a space after the 5, then we've got lowercase letters with full points. Again, we've got two different ways to lay out the dates. We've got the month, the month first and then the date, or we've got the date with an ordinal, so the TH, and then the month afterwards. You know, like I say, it's not that any of these things are wrong, but it's just that if you are um, choosing one of these conventions, you then need to make sure that it's employed in exactly the same way throughout your own writing. Um, so it's things like hyphenation, as I said. So we've got email with a hyphen, and then in the next sentence, email without a hyphen. Um, in the final example, we've got numbers, we've got nine and six, but nine, for example, is written out, whereas six, we use a digit. Um, so these are the things that you need to kind of get on top of in your own writing to ensure your consistency. Now, like I say, if you're writing for a journal or a client, you'll probably be provided with a style guide. So, you know, it's an easy reference guide for you to check. You know whether you should write nine as a digit or write it out in full. Um, if you're writing for yourself, you're writing a blog, for example, um, a really, really handy thing that you can do is to um, create a decisions document. So it can be in a notebook, it can be a file on your desktop, on your computer, whatever works for you. And basically, just write these decisions down as you're going along writing. So make a note of how you're referring to time and dates. Make a note of all the different words that you're hyphenating or not hyphenating. And just have that next to you as you're writing for you to refer back to. So you don't need to keep checking um, as you're going along. And you're also ensuring that your own piece of writing is gonna be consistent. Um, that's a really, really useful way to ensure that these things are kind of picked up. And then when you finish a piece of writing, you can use that decisions document, do a quick search through your document, and you can double check that you've got all these things addressed. Um, and again, like I say, that's a really, really quick way to um, make your writing immediately better. Um, you'll also get much less feedback on your writing, which is always nice because no one likes getting tons and tons of feedback um, so yeah so consistency is probably the biggest thing you can do to make your writing look more professional I would say okay moving on we're going to take a quick look at confusables and agreement so confusables are just basically words that get mixed up um, either in meaning or usage um, and we often get confusion between singular and plural forms um, of verbs, so we're going to look a little bit like a little bit at that, and then we're also going to look a little bit at agreement, which is basically just making sure you're using singular verbs, of singular subjects, and plural verbs of plural subjects. Um, so I've got a list here of some of the words that commonly get confused in the writing we edit. So these are kind of things to look out for. So it's things like making sure you're using the right version of principle. So do you mean principle of value or a proposition or do you mean principal as in the main or first in order of importance? So I've got some examples there that you can look at on the screen. Affect and effect. You know, 
this is one that seems to trip people up um, time and time again. Um, affect is a verb meaning to have an influence and effect is a noun essentially that's basically the the easiest way to remember it i mean effect can also because like i say there are always exceptions can also sometimes be a verb meaning to bring about a result but that tends to be used in very specific content contexts so if you remember affect with an a is a verb effect with an e is a noun that for the most part is going to keep you right um Less and fewer is another really big one. Um, essentially, you want to use less for non-countable nouns and fewer for nouns that you can count. So you can see in my example, I had less potato salad as I had fewer potatoes. You can count potatoes. You, you, you know a particular number of potatoes that you've got. So you'd use fewer. You can't count your potato salad. So you'd use less. And there are lots of kind of like mnemonics you can use for these kind of confusables. So um, something like stationary um, and stationary, um, for example, the way I always remember that is a car with an A would be stationary with an A, not moving. And a pen with an E is an item of stationary with an E. Right. So make up these kind of mnemonics and they'll really they'll really kind of help you because, um, again, these kind of um, this confusion between um, similar words um, is another way that kind of like your writing can look a bit sloppy and we want to kind of eliminate that as much as possible when you're going forwards in your science writing careers. And again, using the right word in the right context is going to keep your writing on message for your readers. Now, issues can also arise with words that originate from other languages, so typically Latin and Greek, for example. Um, some of these words form the plural according to the rules of the original language. So we have something like bacterium becoming bacteria in the plural, but some form the plural in accordance with English rules. So we have something like virus becoming viruses in the plural. And some words, just to keep us all on our toes, can form the plural using either method. So something like formula can form the plural formulae or formulas. Now, generally, a good rule of thumb is to use the Latin and Greek style plurals in formal, technical or scientific writing. Um, but the English plurals, if you're, you know, just chatting with your lab mates or your friends or whatever. So you could use referenda in a science paper or referendums if you're chatting to your mates. So context is really important in language usage. Um, but yeah, in science writing, make sure you're using the correct um, plurals. Um, a word about data. Data is a plural. The singular of data is datum. And, you know, this is one, I, I can't even count the number of hours I've spent correcting data um, in pieces of writing. Um, it is becoming more common to see data used as a singular. You know, if you look at something like the Guardian newspaper in the UK or something called BBC Radio 4, you'll notice that they use a tend to use data now as a singular, but most academic journals, and here at Bite Size Bio, for example, we still use um, data as a plural. So make sure you check your style guide. If in doubt, I would err on the side of caution and keep data as the plural. Um, so you're gonna be using data were rather than data was. Um, but yeah, again, just keep a lookout for those um, plural forms of words and just make sure you're picking the right one. Now I mentioned that we talk about agreement and basically this is just making sure that in any sentence the subject and the verb agree in number and what does this mean? Well this means using a singular verb with a singular subject and a plural verb with a plural subject. So if you're talking about data and like I said we're using data as a plural we'd have these data were collected. Um, Again, obviously, like I said, it's going to depend on your style guide. It's going to depend who you're writing for. But occasionally, you might get data as a singular, in which case data was would be OK. Um, you know, an analysis is singular. Analyses is plural. So again, make sure you're using the right verb. Um, the third example, the choice of singular or plural is a little bit less obvious. And what do you do with collective nouns? Um, so when you've got something like team, committee, group, is that singular or is that plural? And a general rule of thumb is to use a singular verb when all parts of that entity are working together. 
and to use a plural verb when members of that entity, so individual members of that team, are acting individually. Um, and that will generally keep you right. So if all the members of a team are working in unison, you'd have has. And if they're all working individually, you'd have the team have. Punctuation, moving swiftly on. Um, there is absolutely tons we could cover on punctuation. We could probably fill an entire webinar with punctuation. Um, but that would perhaps be a bit too much for anyone. So we're just going to focus on a couple of items today um, that crop up quite a lot in terms of um, their usage. So we're going to look at colons, so the two little dots, and we're going to look at semicolons, so the dot and the dash, and what they do and when to use them. Because getting these right, especially a semicolon, um, will instantly lift your writing and elevate it and make it so much easier to read and look much more polished. And again, this is what we're trying to achieve for those of you who are looking to launch a career in science writing. So we'll start off with the colon. Basically, a colon indicates that what comes after it is directly related to and sums up what comes before it. Colons can also introduce a list of items or examples, but you need to remember that you can use a colon only after a statement that is a complete sentence. And you also need to remember that text that comes after a colon should end that sentence. So if we look at a couple of examples, the first example is wrong because the text before the colon, my favorite foods are, isn't a complete sentence in its own right. You know, that text before the colon has to be able to stand alone. So you'd need to fix it doing something like I've done in the second example. I have two favorite foods, colon, mango and chocolate. Again, in the third example, we wouldn't want something like this because the examples that come after the colon should end the sentence. You can't then run on the sentence with more information at the end. So um, <clears throat> you'd have to change it to something like, I have two favorite foods, mango and chocolate, full stop. I love to eat them every day. You know, that's how to kind of get around that. Those, those examples always have to end the text after the colon. And a really good rule of thumb, if you're not sure if a colon is the right piece of punctuation to be using, is to replace it with namely. So if that works, I have two favorite foods, namely mango and chocolate. You know, that makes um, a coherent English sentence. That's totally fine. You know that you can use the colon. So replace a colon with namely to check if the colon's being used correctly. The semicolon. <clears throat> Semicolons separate independent clauses that are related but that don't quite warrant being sentences in their own right. And they can also separate items in a complex list. Um, so a semicolon is kind of like a sort of supercharged comma. You know, it's stronger than a comma, but not quite strong as a full point. And it's a really good way of connecting um, related items in a sentence. Um, again, it can be something that you can use to add variety to sentence structure, and it can prevent you having too many short, sharp, abrupt sentences. So in the first example, you'd have something like, my car had its MOT, semicolon, it needed a new fan belt and clutch. Um, it sounds expensive. Um, but you can see that those two clauses, so the one that comes before the semicolon and the one that comes after it, are so closely related um, that to kind of split them up and have them as two independent sentences would be a bit kind of jerky, a little bit abrupt. Again, with a second example, pipettes are stored in the cupboard, the cupboard is under the bench. Again, a semicolon is probably the correct choice here because it kind of um, links those two clauses that are so closely related together. And again, you wouldn't want a full point because it would just make your writing seem a bit too staccato and a bit too stop start. Now, you would never want to use a semicolon with two clauses that are completely unrelated. So apologies again for the example, but you would never want something like, my car had its MOT, I love pasta. Both of those things are absolutely great, but they don't belong together. That's an example when you would need to split those up um, and have them as separate sentences. I mean, I'm not quite sure in what context this would happen, this particular example, um, but yeah, never use a semicolon if the two clauses aren't intimately related. Um, as I said, you could also use semicolons to separate items in a complex list. So if you have items in a list that already contain 
commas, you want to use semicolons at the end of each item just to kind of help the reader's eye, help them work out where distinctions come between list items. So in the fourth example here, um, <clears throat> you wouldn't want to be using commas there just because it would probably start to get a little bit confusing. Now, moving on from that, but it's also kind of related. Um, we're going to take a little look at run-on sentences. And I think people often think that run-on sentences are basically just super long sentences that go on and on and on. Um, but actually, a run-on sentence is when you have two or more independent clauses that are connected incorrectly. It's absolutely nothing to do with sentence length. Um, so if we look at some examples, hopefully this will become clear. I ran my experiment, I got no results. Something like that would be a run-on sentence. We can see that we've got two independent clauses. We've got, I ran my experiment, independent clause one, I got no results, independent clause two. But you can see that they're smushed together with no punctuation. So there are several ways that you can fix this. Um, going back to the semicolon, which we've just been talking about, you can pop the semicolon in there because the two clauses are closely related. Um, you can link them together like that. You can use a full point or a full stop. There's absolutely no problem with that, but it can kind of, a full stop is often sometimes a bit strong. It can um, disrupt the rhythm of your writing um, and make it seem a bit too jerky, a bit too staccato, as we've been saying before. Um, so although it's technically correct, it might not always necessarily be the right choice. Now you can use a comma to fix a run on sentence, but never just a comma. If you're going to have a comma, you need to follow that comma with what's known as a coordinating conjunction. So one of those little linking words, so something like but or and or so. Um, because if you don't, if you just have a comma with no coordinating conjunction, it can lead to something known as comma splice, which um, should be avoided at all costs. Um, a comma splice is basically when you're trying to mash two independent clauses together with only a comma, you know, which is quite a big ask for a little piece of punctuation, you know, that's not what it's intended for. Um, and so something like John loves science, he's great at PCR. And the way to tell if you've got a comma splice is to look at the text before the comma, John loves science. Okay, that's a complete sentence in its own right. So you know that it's an independent clause. Then look at the the text after the comma, he's great at PCR. Again, that could be a complete sentence in its own right. So that's another independent clause. But we've got those two independent clauses linked with a comma. Um, and that isn't the function of a comma. That's not good grammar. Um, but there are various ways to fix this. And it goes back to what we've just been saying. You can use a comma, but you need a coordinating conjunction. So something like and in this case. Um, Again, you could make it into two sentences using a full point, but again, that's probably a little bit abrupt. And I think in this instance, the best way to fix this is to use a semicolon. Those clauses are so closely related that they can kind of work together in a single sentence with a semicolon. It allows the sentence to flow because those clauses are linked. Um, so I reckon in this instance, that's probably the best choice. But use one of those examples, um, and that's the best, like that's a really easy way to fix comma splice, but this is something that you should look out for um, in your writing, because again, comma splice can just make your the meaning of your writing difficult to understand and hard for your readers to follow. And basically, we want to make your writing as easy to follow as possible. Okay. Final item, number 10, on today's whistle stop tour of grammar. Um, is restrictive and non-restrictive relative clauses. And I didn't mean to leave a scary sounding one to the end. Um, it's not as scary as it sounds, I promise. Basically, a relative clause is one that is linked to the main clause of a sentence by that, which, who, whom, or whose. Now, if you have a restrictive clause, it's providing essential information about the noun or the pronoun in that main clause. So it cannot be removed from a sentence because it defines or it classifies that main noun. A non-restrictive clause, however, adds extra non-essential information and you can leave it out without affecting the meaning of the sentence. You know, it's extraneous, you know, it could be put in brackets. Um, 
it isn't essential to the meaning of the sentence. Um, you can't get rid of the restrictive part, however, because it specifically defines the noun. And if it's helpful, if you don't like the terms restrictive and non-restrictive, you can think of these as defining and non-defining clauses if that's more useful. So again, let's look at a couple of examples. The pipettes that are in the cupboard are mine, or the pipettes which are in the cupboard are mine. So in the restrictive example, it's only the pipettes in the cupboard that are being claimed. You know, some pipettes could be elsewhere, they could be lying all over the bench, but we're not interested in those. It's only those ones specifically in the cupboard that anyone is claiming. You know, um, that restrictive clause is essential. If you took it out, you'd find yourself asking, well, which pipettes? Or in the second example, I pulled up all the flowers that were yellow. Um, if you didn't have that restrictive part that were yellow, you'd find yourself asking, well, what flowers? Um, in the non-restrictive examples, so the pipettes, which are in the cupboard, are mine, or I pulled up all the flowers, which were yellow. It's incidental that the pipettes happen to be in the cupboard. You know, it's extra information. It isn't essential to the meaning of the sentence. And in the second example, um, in the in the in the restrictive example, um, the angry gardener is only pulling up yellow flowers. You know, pink, red, or purple flowers might be safe. Whereas in the non-restrictive um, sentence, all the flowers are getting pulled up. You know, and it's just incidental that they happen to be yellow. It's extra information. So a way to kind of remember this kind of rule is to think that non-restrictive clauses will be preceded by which, who, whom, or whose. A non-restrictive clause will never be preceded by that, um, whereas a, a restrictive one generally will be preceded by that. So a restrictive clause defines the main noun, a non-restrictive clause or a non-defining clause adds extra information. And again, this is something that we come across quite a lot in editing. Um, and it takes, it can perhaps take a little bit longer to kind of get used to this one, but it is something to look out for. Um, and again, mixing up restrictive and non-restrictive clauses can lead to ambiguity for your readers. So if this is something you can get to grips with, um, it really is going to help improve your writing. And that folks, brings us to the end of our top 10 um, grammar pitfalls. I really hope that you've all found something useful um, in there to take away into your own writing to hopefully help you um, move forward if you're looking to launch a, um, a, a career in science writing or a sideline in science writing. And I really um, hope you can take something away um, from these grammar points. And before we kick off the questions, um, I do just want to draw your attention to our Science Writer Academy, which you can access via the Bite Size Bio website. And we've got tons of information about um, what the Science Writer Academy does, you know, um, ways to go about becoming a science writer, if that's something you're interested in doing you know opportunities we have here at Bite Size Bio for writing and we've also got lists of our upcoming courses you know this is something that we're going to be doing a lot more of in the future so our next course coming up in November um, is going to be on top tips for writing a research poster and then in the coming months we've also got things like what is science writing we've got things on writing for the web which is becoming increasingly important um, We've got things on referencing and these courses are intended to help you launch or develop careers as science writers. They're packed full of top tips and writing hints. So please do check out the website and also keep a lookout for our emails announcing registration. Um, but all that's left for me to say before we open the floor for questions then is thank you very much for listening and good luck with your writing. Well, thanks, Jen. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, we have a few questions from the, uh, the, the audience. If anyone else has a question, please feel free to uh, post it into the questions box that appears on the bottom of your screen. Um, so the first question, Jen, is from um, Ron, who asks, what's the difference between a run-on sentence and a sentence fragment? Okay, so um, thanks for your question, Ron. Um, we touched on um, run-on sentences in the presentation, and that's basically when you have two independent clauses that are incorrectly connected. So that's normally because they're smushed together without any kind of um, coordinating conjunction, so any of the kind of linking words that should link them together or um, incorrect punctuation. 
Now, a sentence fragment is kind of related, um, but sort of the opposite end of the spectrum. And it's when you have um, a series of words um, that don't form a complete sentence. That's normally because you've got something like the subject missing or the verb missing or because those um, that collection of words is a dependent clause. So it kind of relies on, um, you know, what's what's come before in a sentence. So it would be a sentence that was something like because of the pandemic or um, look forward to seeing you. So, you know, there's no subject. Um, sometimes there's in the, because of the pandemic, well, because of the pandemic, what? There's no verb. You don't kind of have the, the rest of the reference um, to make the sentence a complete sentence. So that would be a sentence fragment. Now, <clears throat> context is really important here. Um, in formal writing, so if you're doing academic writing, something like that, you want to try and avoid um, sentence fragments at all costs because um, they can um, make the meaning um, obscured. It can be difficult to work out what it is you're trying um, to say. But I don't know, something like look forward to seeing you, which you get at the bottom of an email, um, you, you know you know the kind of context, you can kind of work that out. So I would say avoid them in formal writing. Um, in informal writing, you know, they're kind of a bit more permissible, um, but they can also kind of be a creative writing technique. So this is something we're going to cover in one of our courses coming up um, next year, um, creative writing techniques for scientists and things to use, but it would be something like, um, they said the experiment was impossible, they said he couldn't do it, but he did. The but he did would be a fragment. Um, but again, that context, you know, it kind of makes it, um, it makes it more understandable. Um, so, um, you can use sentence fragments. Um, they're a bit more kind of permissible than say a run-on sentence, which always probably wants to be um, corrected, but a sentence fragment, um, avoid informal writing and make sure context makes it clear would be my advice for that. Okay, thanks, <clears throat> Jen. That was a very comprehensive answer. Uh, so the next question is from Issa Tu, who, this is quite a broad question, who asks, how do I overcome the challenges of academic writing? Okay, um, obviously there, there are lots of challenges to face in academic writing, you know, it's kind of, um, it's developing tone, it's knowing which punctuation to use, and um, it's knowing the correct words to use. Um, and basically, I would say the cornerstone of academic writing, and in fact, any writing, so whether you're writing blogs, whether you're writing marketing pieces, um, whether you're writing an email, you want to make your writing clear, you want to make it concise, and you want to make it simple. Um, so basically, what you're aiming to do is get your message across in as simple a way as possible, so that as many people as possible are going to understand it. So that means... <clears throat> you know, avoiding things like overly long sentences, like I've been saying, it means using the active voice as much as possible. And um, so it's clear who's doing actions, for example, it means getting rid of jargon. And that's a really big one in academic writing. You know, if you're writing um, a journal article um, about something really, really specific and technical, you tend to use a lot of jargon, you have like acronyms. And for the most part, you know that um, uh, people in your field are going to understand those, but you have to remember that these pieces are always also going to be available for a general readership who might not be um, as au fait or as kind of familiar with jargon and acronyms and things like that. So I would say limit that as much as possible. Um, and that's really, really going to help your writing. Um, but essentially, um, the key to kind of improvement writing is to practice. You need to write lots. Um, so write as much as you can. Um, you know, th there's truth in the adage that practice makes perfect. And I would say as well, you need to get feedback from others. That's so, so important to help improve your writing. So it doesn't necessarily need to be formal feedback all the time. You know, it can be giving a piece of writing to a lab mate or a colleague and getting them to read over it. And it's also being able to take on board feedback. So if you find that you're getting feedback from your writing and you kind of find that you're getting the same things coming up again and again and again, a really kind of useful um, tip is to kind of keep a document on your desktop or keep a notebook or something, however you prefer to kind of do it and jot down the feedback that you are consistently getting. And then each time you write a new piece, look at that feedback and you know I don't know if you find that you always forget data is plural for example you know go through your piece of writing and check every instance of data um, and you know kind of doing that each time then it's going to be kind of come it's going to become second nature and um, so have that kind of feedback document but yeah um, practice lots and um, 
get feedback and those two things are really really going to help improve your writing um i hope that's kind of covered the cover the gist of what you were what you were wanting in that question <laughs> Great answer, Jen. Um, so the next question is from Muhammad, who asks, uh, what should be used, active voice or passive voice in academic writing like research papers and articles? <clears throat> so in, in the presentation, I mentioned that um, passive voice is typically what's used in um, research papers and academic papers. And you know, I think the kind of um, historically, this is because you think good papers are modelled on papers that have come before, and that tends to have been the kind of the, the consensus is that in academic writing, you use the passive voice because you know oftentimes it doesn't matter necessarily who who has done an experiment. You know, it's kind of um, the experiment's perhaps more important than the subject or the actor, the person doing it. Um, and the passive voice can kind of um, enable you to sort of have that objective distance sometimes. You want to kind of be dispassionate if you're writing an academic paper oftentimes. Um, and that tends to be why the passive voice has been adopted more often. Um, I would say it's probably going to depend um, for whom you are writing. Um, so if you're unclear, I would check with, check with your journal, check with your journal editor if you're writing an academic piece. There has um, been a bit more of a trend recently, especially in um, science writing, um, like in academic science writing, for um, the active voice to become more common and the kind of the author to become a bit more um, obvious or kind of visible in the paper themselves. Um, and I think that's people, you know, kind of realizing perhaps that, that can help them get their message across. So, you know, um, I know it's become like quite a big thing in um, ecology and like nature writing, for example. Um, and I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that. I think like if you can, if you feel that you can insert yourself as a subject in your academic paper and it's, it helps you get your message across, then it's absolutely fine to use the active voice. Um, basically, you need to, you need to pick the technique. So you need to pick the whichever one you think is going to be most appropriate to helping you get your message across in that piece of writing. And that is going to depend on the specific context of that particular piece of writing. So it's not that one is wrong and one is right. You know, they, they both have a place and you need to kind of make a judgment as a writer in each instance, which one you think is going to be best for the purposes of that piece of writing. I hope that helps. <laughs> so it's a bit of a sit on the fence answer, but... Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Thanks, Jen. Um, so the next question is from uh, Jana, who asks, uh, um, is there a good source of information for converting American English and British English or British English and American English? Um, I would say your first port of call is probably going to be um, a dictionary. Um, so <laughs> it's a pretty kind of, you know, a straightforward answer. You can use an online dictionary. Um, obviously, there are there are kind of um, particular differences between um, British and American spelling. So, um, you know, um, word endings, for example, or um, for example, in British English, you know, you um, tend to use different endings if you're using a verb or a noun. So for example, the difference between practice with a C and practice with an S, whereas something like American English doesn't make those distinctions, you'd always use an S, for example. Um, so if you're writing for a client or you're writing for a journal, you'll be given a style guide and that will um, determine, you know, the particular kind of um, spelling you need to use. So make sure you check that. Um, if you don't have that, um, check a dictionary, so an online dictionary. Um, that will kind of tell you um, the, the conventions to use. Um, you know, it's the, the differences between like using a U in colour or not you know, just C-O-L-O-R. Um, so yeah, a dictionary, an online dictionary, um, lots of grammar books, so lots of grammar reference books will um, outline differences between British and American spelling. Um, so again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier, get hold of a grammar reference book because um, that will be really handy um, for kind of um, outlining those differences. Um, but yeah, I mean, if all else fails, Google will, Google will tell the online dictionaries that come up when you, when you Google that will Will give you the answers to um, British and American spellings if you don't have those resources to hand. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is from Michal, uh, uh, who asks, can you use a number spelled out only at the beginning of a sentence, even when you use numbers in the rest of the text? I suppose the sentence should not start with a number, but do I rather need to change the sentence so that the number is not at the beginning? Um. 
ideally, probably yes, um, especially if it's a, a number over 10. So for the most part, style guides, um, you know, journal style guides, um, things like that will um, probably um, kind of stipulate that numbers one to nine would be written out and then numbers 10 and above would be digits. Um, now obviously, if you have a number that's 10 or above at the beginning of a sentence, um, it's probably not best practice to start a number with it and start a sentence with a digit. So you wouldn't want to start a sentence with like 94. Um, so yes, if you can rewrite the sentence, that's the easiest way around it. So I don't know, um, you could put like a total of at the beginning of your sentence. And then that kind of, you know, is a really, a really easy way to um, avoid that problem. Um, so yeah, rewriting the sentence because ideally you probably want to avoid um, having a number at the beginning. If it's a number, um, less than 10 and then the other numbers within your sentence are also less than 10 you can have it written out and that's fine um but it's when you're starting a sentence with a digit that's that's kind of what you want to avoid yeah thanks jen so the next question is from uh, Sadesh, who says hello thanks for this webinar i want to ask how to overcome the difficulties in paraphrasing a text for example the known facts in biology or in in research in general, can't be extensively reframed. Is there a, any good source, a book or online resource, which can be used to refer to for par paraphrasing texts? Good question. Um, I'll kind of go back to what I was saying um, earlier about the kind of, there's kind of like a sort of like holy trinity of um, good writing. And that's that it wants to be clear, that it wants to be concise, and it wants to be simple. So obviously, if you're if you're dealing with um, complex um, concepts, um, you know, with difficult um, or long kind of, you know, chemical formulae, um, long names, things like that, yes, absolutely, when you're writing um, for different audiences, you're going to want to paraphrase that. Um, so basically, you need to kind of um, try and distill your message um, and make it as simple as possible for your audience. So make it clear, make it concise and make it simple. That means using, you know, really simple trick is, um, I don't know, if you're using words like utilize, you know, change that to something like use. You don't need to use difficult, difficult. You don't need to use um, long words for the sake of it to kind of, you know, I don't know, there's there's often a, a, a kind of feeling that the longer the words you use, the more scholarly you are. But actually, that's kind of not the purpose of um, academic writing or any writing. The purpose is to get your message across, especially if you're trying to get someone to do something. Um, so avoid jargon as far as possible kind of goes back to what I was saying before. Um, avoid loads of unnecessary acronyms. You know, quotations are okay, um, but you need to make sure you reference them properly and make sure you don't use them um, too much in, um, in your writing. Um, and a good tip that you can kind of use is if you're trying to rewrite a concept, you know, read that concept, cover up, cover it up, and then try and rewrite it in your own words and do that several times and kind of see what you come up with. Um, you know, practice, like keep, re keep rewriting and try and do it differently and try and each time distill your meaning into um, um, fewer words. Um, another tip when you're trying to paraphrase is to get rid of the fluff in your writing. Again, it kind of, um, you know, all the kind of extraneous stuff that you sort of put around your sentences. So things like having said that, or it goes without saying, or, um, you know, now, now I'm going to go on to say, you don't need that kind of stuff. You know, that's the stuff that clutters up your writing and obscures your meaning. So again, make sure if you're paraphrasing, get rid of all those kinds of things. Um, there are tools that you can you can find on the internet. So something like Grammarly, I think has um, has a paraphrasing tool. Um, but I would try and say, don't rely too much on um, like automated um, computer generated paraphrasing. Like if you can kind of do it yourself as far as possible, that's better. That's gonna make your writing seem, um, seem more natural. Um, so yeah, so things like that. So basically just, it's kind of, you know, when you have to, when you're preparing for your Viva, and um, for those of you who have kind of got to that stage and you basically have to try and, um, you know, explain your thesis in, um, you know, six sentences and then you have to explain it in three sentences and then you have to explain it in one sentence. You know, try and do that with the concepts you're trying to explain in your paper. Um, and that can kind of be a really good tip. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope that helps. Thanks, Jen. Um, so the next question uh, is from Ivy. So you mentioned run on sentences and she asked, uh, for run on sentences, could we also use conjunctions? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I'm, I think I mentioned that on the slide, and when we're gonna, as I mentioned, these slides are gonna be um, available, and the recording is gonna be available on demand. Um, yes, absolutely. If you have a conjunction, you can absolutely fix a run-on sentence with a conjunction. So one of those, I think, in the example, had but, and um, so one of those little linking words, so and, but, so. Um, and if you're going to fix a run on sentence with a comma, for example, that comma would always need to be followed by a coordinating conjunction. You couldn't fix a run on sentence with just a comma because that would lead to comma splice, which is what we were talking about earlier. And that is that's a that's a no no for writing. So, yeah, absolutely. Yes, you can use conjunctions. OK, uh, so uh, this question is from Vikram who asks, uh, could you please suggest some textbooks or online resources to improve grammar in academic writing? I guess you could always email him, but uh, do any come to mind? Um, one that I really like, um, and this actually started life as a podcast, so the podcast is still available, so um, I would encourage you to go and listen to that as well. Um, grammar Girl, um, her right, her, she's got several books, you know, she's got ones on usage and um, you know, quick tips for better writing and stuff, but they are really accessible, um, you know, really kind of um, funny, um, lots about usage, because I think oftentimes like these kind of things about grammar are actually um, more about usage, um, you know, and it's not necessarily that things are um, wrong. I mean, so sometimes, yes, there are particular rules, um, but yeah, she's, um, her books, so Grammar Girl, Mignon Fogarty, um, her books are really accessible. Like I mentioned, Punctuation, so Eat Shoots and Leaves by Lynn Truss, um, that's a great one for punctuation. It's a bit more kind of narrative, um, but it's a really, it's a really good read. Um, she's really funny. Um, what else could we have? Um, you know, online, like um, things like Grammarly that we've mentioned, they have kind of, you know, different tips. Um, like the Chicago Manual of Style website has like a Q&A section, like those things can be really useful. And it kind of depends what you're looking for. You know, if you want something um, specifically for scientists, something like the open notebook, um, which you can access online as well. Um, but I mean, there are there are tons and tons and tons of different grammar books available. So you need to find the one that is going to is going to suit you if you want something, you know, um, straight down the line a bit more kind of stage you want to know like the rules um you can you know you can get like Fowler's modern um English usage something like that um but if you want something more accessible yeah something like Grammar Girl is is a really good easy way uh, easy place to start okay um thanks Jen uh, so another question from Michal uh, who asks uh, should subordinate clauses be separated by commas and when should they not if so Oh, um, <laughs> this might be one that might actually be easier to answer um, by email, so I can kind of give you give you examples, some um, some yeah. written examples, which I think kind of might um, might make it um, a bit easier um, to kind of see. Um, I mean, short answer, um, yes, um, but again, it's going to kind of depend on context. So if that's OK, what I'll do is we'll make a note of um, of these ones where it's perhaps going to be easier for you to see written examples. And then I will um, email the answers to these if, if that if that sounds good. That, that's that's absolutely perfect. OK, so the next question is uh, from uh, Rehab, uh, who asks, could you clarify the use of hyphen and n dash? Yes. Um, so I think we had another. That's, yes, again, this is uh, this is one that perhaps might um, might benefit from um, you seeing examples. Um, basically, a hyphen would be used to um, connect words if you're trying to make like a, a compound word or something. So um, I don't know, um, self antigen or something. Um, if you want to connect those two words and make it a single unit, you would use a hyphen. So the, the shortest of the dashes. Um, an N dash, which is the slightly longer dash, um, would be used to um, connect items in a range. So if you had a date range, for example, you'd use an N dash, or if you had a page range, I don't know if you're doing your references or something like that, um, you'd use an N dash. You'd also use an N dash if you are trying to connect um, two terms of equal weight. So if you had something like Epstein Barr virus, um, they're, they're two names. Um, so their equal weight, so you need to connect those using an n dash, and a hyphen in that instance would be wrong. Um, so hyphen, if you're trying to to turn things into a single concept, um, an n dash for ranges. 
essentially, but I will, um, you also get an M dash, which again is slightly different. Um, and that can be for parentheses and different things like that. And um, so what I will do is I will um, pop some examples down to email around to everyone so you can so you can see some written examples because I know some people find find that easier to be able to certainly I know I do to see to see it on the screen so okay thanks Jen um so another question this one from Laura who asks why is consistency so important and how do you decide on the style consistency is I mean it is probably the, the single biggest thing you can do to improve your writing without too much effort. Um, you know, <clears throat> it's it's something that editors spend most of their time um, correcting. Um, and it's it's just a really, really, really easy way to polish up your writing. It's like what I was um, saying earlier, going back to the kind of like first impressions. If your if your piece of writing is littered with inconsistencies and you've used three different ways to kind of like render dates, you know, that's going to it's going to make your writing look sloppy um, and it's then going to affect the the way that people perceive your writing which if they're worrying about you know your your style of writing rather than the words that you're actually using and the meaning you're trying to get across your message is being lost and that's what we try want to try and avoid um, so like I said it will depend on who you're writing um, for so if you're writing for a journal if you're writing a nature paper for example or something like that you're writing for Elsevier they will have a style guide that will get sent out to you so you need to make sure you're following the conventions within that style guide and um, they will determine like which words are hyphenated you know what you do with dates um you know how you should set out references and it's really really important that if you have a style guide you do follow it um, and like I said if you're if you are blogging for example so you're you're setting up your own blog um to kind of get your science writing out there um it really really would pay to um, sit down and take the time to kind of um, outline some of these conventions for yourself. So decide how you're going to render dates, decide what you're going to do with numbers. Um, because, you know, making your writing consistent and having a consistent way to render those things is just going to make your writing look so much more professional um, and really kind of improve the, improve the first impression that your writing creates, which then means people can concentrate on your message, which is what we want. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, the next question is um, from Marcella, who asks, could you give an example where it is not penalizing the use of apostrophes in science writing? Um, I think, I think, are you talking, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about contractions here. So that's kind of how, I, how I'll answer it. And then um, if I'm, if I'm not just pop another question in and then, um, and we'll, we'll kind of um, take it from there. Um, so um, a contraction would be kind of like, you know, shortening words or using things like it's and haven't and stuff like that. And I would say um, probably like a general rule of thumb, again, if you're writing an academic paper, you're writing for something like nature or science or cell or something like that, um, you probably want to avoid contractions and using apostrophes and stuff like that, um, just because it does tend to be seen as a little bit more informal um, and journals tend to still have a very kind of like formal style and um, so avoid them in in those cases and um, again if you're writing something like a blog you can be a bit more informal you can kind of be a bit more chatting if you're writing for a bite-sized bio for example like contractions are totally fine like we don't we don't mind using um, apostrophes and um, because that kind of um, informal style can create um, more of a connection with our readership and make it seem a bit more kind of accessible and stuff so again it's going to massively depend on the context and um, for whom you're writing um, so some science writing, absolutely, yes. Um, for more academic papers, I would probably say try and avoid contractions. Okay, thanks, Jen. Uh, just a few more questions. Uh, this one from uh, Paloma, who asks, uh, when using the subject to form of a verb, uh, the verb has to be, does the verb have to be in plural or in singular? Well, again, that's going to depend on the, on the context. Um, um, so I will um, I would I will put some examples. Do you mean subjunctive there? Uh, um, subjunctive, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, that's going to depend on the context. And that might be one um, for the emails, and I will jot you down some examples so you can see um, when to use the subjunctive and the, and the best the best kind of usage for that. Because again, that's something that kind of like um, trips people up. Um, yeah, 
when conditional clauses, things like that. So that's that's probably one for some examples so people can see what we're talking about. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's a couple of uh, fairly general questions here. This one from Lena, mm -hmm. who says, thank you very much for the webinar. Uh, what do you think uh, the best ways to improve science writing for a researcher? Practice. Practice, 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 write lots, um, read lots also, like read read different styles of writing, you know, don't just read academic papers, like read a huge variety of different kinds of things, you know, like read newspaper articles, like read the classics, read Dickens, read Jane Austen, read, 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 read lots, and then write lots, because the more you read, um, the more you kind of get a sense of um, what makes for good writing. And, you know, um, techniques that work really well for writers, you know, if you kind of see something, you think, oh, that, that's great. I love that piece of writing. Try and break it down and see what that, see what that writer's done and then see if you can use those kind of techniques. Um, so, yeah, write lots. But if you're writing lots, you need you need to send that writing out there. And I know that can be really hard sometimes, um, but you need to get feedback. You need to kind of have some kind of like audience kind of participation in your writing so that you know um, if you're um what you think the message you're trying to get across is actually getting across to your readership um because sometimes the the hardest thing in writing can be culling those bits of um writing that you're like totally proud of and you spent ages and you think they're the best sentence you've ever written but actually if that doesn't connect with the with the people that you're trying to reach that sentence isn't going to work um so you have to write lots and you have to get feedback now sometimes you might want to write something stick it in a drawer go away and then come back to it because i think if you're really if you're still really immersed in that piece of writing it can be difficult to kind of um look at it a bit more objectively and um, so always give yourself time and redraft and edit like you'll probably spend i don't know you'll probably edit I know, like something like 50% of what of what you originally write and um, trying to kind of like distill that message. Um, so yeah, so read lots, write lots and get feedback. Okay, thanks, Jen. Um, just checking if I haven't missed any questions. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, I, I think this this is the final question, Jen. Mm -hmm. um, so this one's from Connor, who says, you mentioned uh, opportunities for writing at Bite Size Buyer. How do I get involved? Yeah, absolutely. Like I say, um, we are always on the lookout for um, for new writers. Um, so um, the first step would be to attend some of our courses. Like you can see on the screen, we've got, we've got lots of courses coming up. Um, so kind of, you know, attend our science writing course and see what it's all about if it's new to you if it's something you're kind of interested in moving into and um, whether as a career or a kind of sideline um, and then you know these will kind of give you like lots of top tips like some of our upcoming courses will be really specific to writing for bite-sized bio for example and um, but like i say we are we're always on the lookout for new writers so if you think you've got something that you can share with um our global audience so whether that's you know you're a wizard at a particular technique or you know there's there's a new kind of technology out there that you think would really benefit um other people knowing about and you think that you can be the one to kind of um disseminate that to other people would absolutely love to hear from you um so um you can email a brief to us you can get in contact with us and email us a brief and then one of our editorial teams so that's either adam um laura or myself and um, we'll work with you to kind of refine that brief make sure it um you know meets the needs of our audience um that it kind of um you know suits the bite size by a voice and tone and stuff so we'd work quite closely with you and then you'd be able to submit an article with the ultimate aim being that we would publish that article um on our blog and then for um, the really, really special writers, um, so those of you who are really keen um, and you kind of, you know, we've worked with you to kind of, um, you know, polish up your grammar and, your, and things like that. Um, we also have commercial clients and there are also um, potential opportunities to work with commercial clients um, for some of our writers as well. So the first port of call would be to get in after you've kind of checked out our Writer Academy website signed up for some more of our courses get in touch with us about about a brief about something you want to write about and um and we can take it from there fantastic thanks uh, jen 
Um, so uh, that brings us to the end of today's webinar. Thanks again, Jen, for a, a very illuminating presentation and, a, and I think a great discussion. Um, and finally, thanks to you, the audience, for taking the time to attend and listen in. Um, as Jen mentioned, uh, we'll, we'll be emailing out a link to view a recording of this webinar. Um, please also remember to visit the Science Writer Academy page at sciencewriteracademy.bitesizebio.com. Um, uh, where you can see our other courses that we've got lined up for you. Our next live event takes place on the 17th of November at uh, 10 a.m. GMT and is titled Top Tips for Writing a Research Poster. Um, I'm sure you've all missed many things about attending in-person conferences over the past 18 months uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, such as uh, socializing and lost networking opportunities. And perhaps you're eagerly gearing up to attend uh, a conference in the coming months, uh, or perhaps you're going to be attending your first ever conference. So our course will lay out our top tips and handy hints for producing the best research poster, including um, choosing a title, colors to avoid, and even where you should stand when presenting your poster. Um, and registration for this event will be opening very shortly. Um, so until next time, uh, good luck uh, in your writing and goodbye from all of us at Bite Size Bio Science Writer Academy. Thank Thanks you. Thanks everyone, bye.